This week on the Angus Report, we learn about biosecurity management and concentrated feeding operations. Hear from American Angus Association CEO, Mark McCulley, learn about the dynamics of calving season, and we meet Jarrah Settles, our final Angus Foundation success story. This is the Angus Report. Hello and welcome to the Angus Report. I'm Katie Holdener. Having a detailed biosecurity plan is a must, especially in the case of a disease outbreak or natural disaster. Adam Page, an environmental specialist at the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, discusses resources concentrating feeding operations have when a sum of death loss occurs. So it's really important to have a biosecurity plan, uh, and in that plan, it needs to be as preventative as possible. And uh, you don't want to wait. You don't want to put a plan in after the fact. You want to have the plan up front because otherwise, you're really not doing any, any good. Uh, there are multiple agencies who are there to help provide resources and, and uh, assist you with making these kinds of plans. So every plan should be very site specific because your, your farms can be different than the next farm down the road and different than the next farm in Iowa and everything else. But you want to make sure that you're doing all the things uh, to be pre prepared up front before the event happens. And so that's why you have the state and federal agencies uh, here to basically assist you however we can. Page explains mortality can fall into two categories, routine and mass. Routine mortalities are the mortalities that are just part of normal operations. Um, when you're running a CAFO, there's going to be deaths that just happen from natural causes. So those are okay. usually going to be confined to the facility. They're going to be either composted, uh, shipped off, uh, depends. So those are routine. Mass mortalities are the unexpected um, due to disease or natu other natural causes, such as uh, an entire building goes out of service due to a tornado, things like that. And during those situations, especially when it's disease related, we're going to look at trying to keep the disease contained, whether that's doing large scale composting on site. Um, you can still uh, go to landfills, other, other facilities, but you got to make sure that you're following all the other Department of Natural Resources, Department of Ag, Department of uh, Veterinary uh, policies during that process, so you're not spreading the disease. CAFOs are required to be inspected to ensure regulations and safety requirements are being met. So when we go and inspect CAFOs, typically uh, it's a permitted facility, so we're going to go and we're going to be inspecting based off that permit. So we're looking at things such as all uh, CAFOs in Missouri are no discharge facilities, so they're not allowed to discharge any of the waste into the environment. So we're making sure that that's not occurring. We're also looking at the uh, sheds to make sure that they're structurally uh, sound, that there's not any issues with contamination or vector control. Uh, we're looking at um, the feed bins, making sure that they're properly maintained and, and everything else that, that's in the permits, basically making sure they're compliant. Mortality management can be a difficult situation, but your Department of Natural Resources can assist. There are different ways to manage mortality. So one of them would be incineration. That's where you're going to bring an incinerator on site and actually get rid of the bodies that way. The advantage of that is that it does control the vector very, very well. I mean, you are incinerating the whole product. Uh, one of the downfalls of that is you do have the cost of having an incinerator on site. Those things use a lot of fuel and therefore cost money. The other issue that can come into play is depending on the, the scale of your incinerator, you may be looking at more air uh, quality permitting, uh, it, uh, permitting requirements depending on the size of the operation, but usually not for your smaller scale ones. Burial, uh, that is really where the, our Department of Natural Resources comes into uh, uh, play because we'll have our um, geological survey will come out and they'll look at your site specifically to see uh, what kind of morphology of your, your rocks that you have on site, your hydrology to make sure if you're going to bury it, everything stays on site, you're not contaminating drinking water supplies, things like that. Uh, the advantage of that is you get to keep it on site. Uh, it's, you don't have to worry about transportation, you don't worry about spreading disease due to transportation. Uh, the downsides of that is you do have to have a burial site on, on your property and uh, if you're going to be selling that property, you do need to let the next, next owners know that that site is, has been uh, used for contamination. So there's a lot of different aspects, which is why it's important to do all this planning, preferably before the event happens, as much as possible so you can you know, consider that in part of your business plan as setting some money aside as, for these events. For more information, visit dnr.mo.gov. Stay tuned for an update with American Angus Association CEO, Mark McCulley. We'll be back with more Angus Report after a break. Welcome back. From the Certified Angus Beef Conference to Angus Convention and everything in between, events and educational opportunities for producers have filled up the calendar. Mark McCauley, American Angus Association CEO, is here with an update. 
Yeah, in the past weeks, I've been busy with some travel, Had a uh, got to experience a wonderful tour uh, up the, hosted by the Montana Angus Association. We got to see some great cattle. We had folks from all over, I think, 30-plus states uh, were represented there at that tour, so that was an outstanding event. Went from there directly to the Certified Angus Beef Annual Conference, where about 600 folks came together, largely representing food service and retail, folks that represent and market and, and sell the brand every Every day. Uh, that conference is really dedicated to celebrate them, to educate them, and to motivate them to sell even more certified Angus beef brand products. So that was an outstanding event. Uh, folks are uh, that are out there representing our end product to food service, to retail chefs. They're incredibly excited about the quality of product that Angus producers are putting out on the marketplace. Uh, they're very, very excited about the demand that's been created and their opportunity to grow their businesses with the certified Angus beef brand. Close the uh, fiscal year here at the American Angus Association. Another, you know, another really strong year. We've had uh, obviously the, the the cattle cycle and the way numbers work, but we saw another year of registering over 300,000 uh, registered Angus cattle here in the U.S. So continue to be super strong demand for those registered Angus genetics within our uh, seed stock industry and our for our commercial producers. With the closing of our fiscal year, so comes the our annual meeting and our Angus convention headed to Reno and awfully excited about the program that uh, we've got put together in store for nearly 2,000 folks that will be in attendance. We've got a, an expanded educational efforts uh, and, and seminars and things for folks to take in. Uh, we've got an, an outstanding trade show where our allied industry partners will be there with new products and services that they'll be showcasing. We'll have some wonderful food at Certified Angus Beef brand products throughout the trade show. And then, of course, we'll wrap up with the annual meeting of our delegates uh, where we'll be doing the uh, year-end business of the American Angus Association. The fall is going to continue to be full of, of Angus activities. We've got some, some great shows in store at the American Royal and the North American International Livestock Exposition in, in Louisville coming up. Uh, lots of sales that our registered breeders have uh, slated for the, this fall season. And then thinking all the way to January at the National, National Western Stock Show, where we'll have another great show, both open and junior shows, as well as a bit of a reformatted uh, bull sale that we're pretty excited to put uh, an outstanding set of bulls together uh, that uh, breeders are consigning to offer out to other uh, seed stock producers and commercial producers alike. We check in now on the latest cattle market news with the Cattle Facts Update. Hello and welcome to the Cattle Facts Update. I'm Patrick Linnell. Nearly three months ago, the Cattle Facts Update reported the unusual strength in the Choice Select spread the difference between the choice and select box beef cutouts. The spread typically narrows in the late summer as slower beef demand in the dog days of summer erodes the premium for choice demand relative to selects. However, the spread saw little to no narrowing this year and now the seasonal favors a steady to wider spread. A major factor in the wide spread has been on the supply side as the tough winter this year proves to have a long tail in the market. Through late winter and spring, cattle entering feed yards were greeted by wet and poor pen conditions from the tough winter. Those conditions clearly impacted feeding performance, and the impact is still being felt as those cattle are currently being marketed and hanging with lower quality grades than last year. As a result, choice grading carcass counts are down 2% or 66,000 head over the last eight weeks compared to last year. On the flip side, Select carcasses are up over 8%, or 58,000 head, over the same period. The effect of the quality grade mix is amplified by the long-term trend of strong demand growth from consumers and retailers for a high-quality beef product. Demand for choice and higher product continues to grow year after year, while select demand softens. Looking forward, with the fall now upon us, the probability of any meaningful decline in the choice select spread is low. Rather, the seasonal favors a widening spread from now until mid-December as attention slowly turns to holiday rib buying action, boosting choice beef demand. This will favor an overall higher trend to the beef cutout into the fourth quarter, especially if grade remains depressed and box beef buyers are forced to chase choice product. 
the demand will be passed on to the fed cattle market as the packing industry chases grade as well. A wider spread will also impact the basis level for cattle feeders. Cattle are grading well above the specification for the CME Live Cattle Futures contract, which is for 65% choice. All else equal, this is worth roughly $2 per hundredweight for today's fed cattle mix over the futures. The February 2021 contract, which recently opened, is the first live cattle contract with the grade specification increased to 70% choice, closer to the industry average. For the Angus Report and Cattle Facts, I'm Patrick Linnell. To learn more about Cattle Facts, your leading source for beef industry market information, visit cattlefacts.com. Next on the Angus Report, we discuss the dynamics of your calving season. Stay with us. Virginia Tech is currently collaborating with the Virginia State Department of Corrections to study the correlation of calving season dynamics in relation to progeny performance. Robin White, Assistant Professor of Integrated Beef Production Systems Management at Virginia Tech, shares the research findings. We have a large uh, collaboration with our State Department of Corrections that has a cow herd of 2,200 animals. Um, and we've been collecting the data from that herd over about a 10 year period to try and understand the dynamics of calving seasons. So we were looking to see whether those cows that, ca that were born early in a calving season when we've retained them through their heifer uh, period and through a first calf heifer, whether they are then producing calves that are born early in the calving season. And what we find is that if a cow was born early, she's more likely to have calves earlier in the calving season. We thought that that would translate to heavier birth weights on those calves as well, and we haven't been able to confirm that. So we're trying to do a little bit more um, querying of this database to understand exactly how this phenomenon of an animal calving early in the calving season confers to increasing um, both, hopefully, birth and weaning weights of those animals. White says management is the key to a successful reproduction program. Reproduction is not just um, a standalone thing, right? In order to have a successful reproductive program, you need to have successful management of your animals. You need to have an appropriate nutritional program to optimize um, their potential, make sure that they're in appropriate body condition. Um, you need to be focusing on how your management is influencing what we're calling selection pressure. So a portion of that being, of course, your genetic management program. A portion of it is also things like culling animals that are not getting bred, i.e. pushing your animals into a closer calving season. Um, and then, of course, the last component of successful reproductive management being integration of our different reproductive technologies, of which there are several. So. Research done in 2012 verifies higher conception rates on a female's first breeding cycle. When you're using an estrus synchronization and breeding protocol like timed artificial insemination, what we see is that you actually get more animals bred on that first breeding cycle. So you can expect to have about 40% of your animals bred in that first 20 days of your breeding season, as opposed to uh, a natural service system where you can expect more of a bell curve. So you'd have closer to a quarter of your animals bred in that first 20 days. What they identify is because you have um, an additional 20 to 25% of your animals calving early in the season, you have that many more calves that have many, many more days to grow. As a result, the average weaning weight of your calves is heavier. Um, I think that the difference in weaning weights in that study was something like 40 pounds. And so based on um, your, your reflective prices for that type of animal, you could expect something like a $60 increase in your revenues for each one of those animals. White says the timing of breeding affects weaning weights. So a follow-up study um, to the group that had done that timed AI study actually tracked animals over um, their lifespan of, in terms of reproductive productivity. And what they see is that change in weaning weights observed um, associated with those cows that are calving early in the calving season versus those calving later in the calving season is observed not only for their first calf, but actually for the first five calves they have. So this is an investment trying to get your animals, uh, particularly those first calf heifers, um, 
and, and your maiden heifers calving in in the first 20 days of that season is going to have a benefit in terms of um, what you see in this weaning season, but also what you see in subsequent weaning seasons for those animals. That same study also tracked the longevity of those animals. And what they find is that those cows that are calving in the first 20 days of the calving season um, are much more likely to be retained in the herd. So at 10 years um, of age, I think approximately 80% of those animals are still in the herd, whereas those animals that are calving later in the calving season, perhaps the last 20 days of the calving season, um, more like 60% of those animals are still around. Our study at Tech is trying to confirm a lot of those results. And oh, we're very early in that process. And, and certainly at this point, our biggest challenge is lacking the weaning weight data. But we hope to, to pull that together over the next six to 12 months and be able to um, confirm those results. For more information, go to apsc.vt.edu. Stay tuned for another Angus success story. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Angus Report. Jara exhibits both the grit and grace it takes to succeed as a professional in the agricultural industry. Now the general counsel and vice president of livestock mitigation at the Livestock Marketing Association, she works day after day to represent the industry that she grew up in. Serving as an essential factor in Jara's decision to attend law school, the Angus Foundation not only provided support through scholarships, but also encourage the confidence and poise it takes to represent her members. Hi, I'm Jara Settles. I'm General Counsel and Vice President of Risk Mitigation at the Livestock Marketing Association, and I'm a former recipient of an Angus Foundation Scholarship. My folks have had Angus cattle since they were little bitty uh, and we were taking pictures of them in belly deep straw. Well, our, our family's been in the Angus breed for a really long time. I uh, grew up on a cow-calf operation, mostly purebred Angus in northeast Nebraska. Um, my folks are still on the farm back home. Went to Butler Community College, which is a, a junior college in Kansas on a livestock judging scholarship for the first two years of my education, and then transferred to Kansas State University to finish up my animal science degree. And then once I was done with that, I uh, went to Topeka to, to Washburn University School of Law to get my JD. A lot of people ask why I wanted to be a lawyer, a little farm kid in Nebraska, what made you want to go be a, a lawyer? And it was a long time ago, I was uh, in grade school and um, mad cow uh, outbreak happened, first time that we'd ever seen it uh, in this continent. And a lot of people freaked out, including Oprah Winfrey. Oprah at that point was the person that a lot of America listened to and she in more or less words, basically warned people uh, against eating beef. And I remember being so mad about it, even as a little kid, because that's not true, it's not right. And uh, a group of uh, Texas cattlemen uh, sued her for those defamatory, or in their mind, uh, defamatory uh, words. Now I know why they didn't win, but at that point, I, I told my mom, I was like, if I was the lawyer on that case, I'd have won that case for the beef industry. And so she told me, well, if that's the case, you better go, uh, go grow up and be a lawyer. So that's what sparked the interest, uh, thanks to Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> We spent every summer going to junior nationals if it was close and, and made sense for us to go. So if you were at the show and when Jarrah was a kid, uh, where would you find me? A little bit of everywhere. My folks were huge advocates of participating in absolutely everything. Uh, we were not the people that showed up to junior nationals and unfolded the lawn chairs and sat at the stalls for the week. We were not those people. And in a lot of times, there was only a, a few Angus junior nationals that my mom and I even took cattle to. A lot of times I would go exclusively for the contests and for those development opportunities, just because the Angus Association has such an incredible program in terms of those contests and in scholarships etc that's why we showed up that's why we went the cattle were always kind of secondary they were always home raised uh, they always stood kind of middle of the class uh, we were glad to show up and show off what we could raise but uh, a number one was participating in those contests the Angus Foundation was essential to me reaching my goals a big piece of 
what I wanted to do in making the decision to go to law school was whether or not I could afford to go to law school. Um, my folks sat me down uh, after I was getting done at K-State and they said, well, um, you know, we've helped you a lot uh, on this path to your education. And if you want to go on, we support you. Uh, but, you know, a lot of that's going to be on you in terms of, of the finances of it. And so, you know, trying to figure out um, where that money was going to come from um, and the fact that the Angus Foundation was there um, in, with respect to the scholarships that I was able to, to win through the Angus Association and the foundation was a huge uh, burden off of my shoulders. I mean, it, it literally opened the door to me being able to afford to finish my education and go on through my educational pursuits. My parents are outstanding human beings. Um, my mom and dad are, are everything to me. And I won't say any more because I'll cry. <laughs> um, don't go. I love them. Sorry. Um, yeah. Delete that. <laughs> So the Angus Foundation's core mission of, of youth education and research uh, are so important to developing young people to come back into uh, our breed and into our communities and into our industry as a whole. If we don't invest in these young people and welcome them back in and give them truly viable opportunities in terms of education and professional growth, they might leave us. And so if we can invest in those young people, invest in their education, invest in them as, as young people and develop that loyalty, I think that really is a drawing factor back, back home, back to the Angus kind of way of life. You're doing great work, Jara. That's a wrap for this week's Angus Report. To ensure that all your educational content is right at your fingertips, our video content was going 100% digital. So, our final episode of the Angus Report on RFD TV will be on November 25th. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Angus TV, to receive all of our educational resources. See you next week.